So unfortunately, looking around the room, uh, I noticed that most of you are too young to get the joke and going to make the analysis or something totally different. But not everyone is too young. We talk about climate change and my research on drugs and mega drugs. It seems super loud. You seem to love to do that. It's here. This is where my office was in June of 2012. This is the picture it was taken when we were evacuated from the building because of the raging wildfire. And we were out for a few days before they let us back in. The fire came up the ridge. Just shortly after I took this picture, there were trees exploding all along the ridge. You didn't see the flames. The trees were just bursting. Bursting into flames. This is taken from my iPhone. Later in the day, the, uh, the skies had darkened and it looked like more war. Very, very impressive wildfire, very close to Boulder. And a few days after they reopened, uh, my advisor and mentor at the time, Sarah Jesser, who's a famous climate scientist, uh, knew that I was working on mega drought and wanted to know if it is because of mega drought. Later that same summer, 2012, I was in, uh, was in St. Louis for a wedding and driving around during 2012, as many of you will remember, it was really terrible drought in that summer that affected corn and other plants throughout the Midwest, caused some huge losses for crops of plants that were irrigated. And the people I was with, student body, wanted to know, you know, is this a mega drought? They were following the great corn apocalypse of 2012. Uh, this is the wrong direction. Here we go. 1950s, some of you will be familiar with the drought that affected California and the southwest in the 1950s. Really painful. Uh, some of our Cornell alumni been in contact with uh, you know, generation after generation of uh, farming in Texas and other parts of the Southwest contacted us and and, and had this uh, these these records and these family memories of dropping in the 1950s as being really really painful year after year after year of drought. And going back even further, just open a historical record, the the granddaddy of all droughts in in North America anyway in the last hundred years. Dust Bowl. Was it a mega drought? And the answer to all these questions is no. When we talk about mega droughts, we're talking about multi decadal periods of duration. And, you know, in the next slide, once we get this working, whoever our tech guy is, Rob Brian, who is a lot of stuff, I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, in the next slide, what you're going to see is the picture I took from the Four Corners region, the southwest of the Pueblo and Rose. And when we talk about mega drought, we're talking about multi decade dolls. No, you've got California, see? That's also not a mega drought. This is a mega drought. This is uh, the result of a multi decade dolls period of breeding, sequence of multi decade dolls periods of breeding in the southwest that, combined with other factors, uh, forced the Pueblo people who had built civilizations into the, the walls of this region to. To return to a more, uh, I guess, simple or, or less well organized, but less centralized form of agriculture. And mega droughts linked to the demise of other civilizations in pre prehistoric times. This is a reconstruction of some details about how these types of reconstructions are put together. But what it's showing you here is that when we use tree ring data to make inferences about drought in the past, there are these periods lasting 30, 40, 50 years sometimes that are drier on average than any part, any part of the historical period. Uh, at least as bad in some of the individual years as the, uh, the 1930s and 1950s drought, but much longer lasting. This is a clip from Wikipedia. Uh, I didn't write it myself, but I did show this at a talk once when I was pretty sure the guy who wrote it was in the audience. Since I watched him on it, I was up there. He's, he's sort of going to hit his face a little bit. He's embarrassed. I'm pretty sure I never wrote it. He's good. He's really good. I won't name him by name, but he's really good. And it's a good definition. I'll let you read it. You can read it back in the talk. But the key things that fall out from this decades or longer, just like most persistence, more than we're talking about extreme camp. And in pre-industrial times, they constitute one of the greatest 
And some of our best records of rain droughts in the past come from tree ring archives. These are moisture, limited moisture sensitive trees, um, entire compilations of them that are collected and from sites in the southwest primarily, but other parts of the world as well. Uh, but in the southwest, you have the advantage of having long lived trees in the sides of mountains that are very moisture limited, and because they're moisture limited, they give you a good proxy for the total the average winter time. And only scientists have gone in and analyzed these, they're not just using the one tree, but it's compilations of these. Many, many records averaged together to get a robust signal of the climate component and try to factor out some of the non climate biological growth or, or insects or other, other uh, sources of variability in tree ring width. You have these huge compilations, you know, dozens of sites on the side of one mountain and then another mountain and then another mountain put together to form a reconstruction of the hybrid climate in the southwest. And you find Found this has been known for quite some time, since even the 70s. Uh, they've been doing this, and we told the governor of Arizona at the time about the evidence for mega droughts for potato periods of aridity in the past, and he said it was one of his worst days in office, realizing that these things were part of the natural variability. They were very, very poorly equipped to be able to handle them if they were to occur again today. I went out in the field long enough to grow up a few field birds. It would make me sound really fiddly and weak, and that's fair. But uh, I, I went out once uh, to try to court trees with some of my, my then drug climatology friends. And uh, in the time that I was able to get three cores, to make that Swedish core so I could get the stick in the side of the tree and crank and crank and crank. Uh, one, of the, one of the younger graduate students with whom I was uh, coring trees got 24, I think. <laughs> so. And at the time, that's it. The University of Southern. This isn't true anymore. This isn't like I'm not plugging my alma mater or anything. I'm putting this out here because at the time I was there, the, the tree ring lab was actually in the stadium. It was right underneath these bleachers, partly, which is very convenient on Saturday if you want to take a break from work and get some delicious popcorn. They moved it. They actually had their own building. And I parked myself there with the tree ring. I did like a little mini study abroad. Across campus in the tree ring lab for a semester, and much to my professor's chagrin at the time. But I learned about how the science of dendrochronology, at least in the rudimentary sense, works and is used to develop these reconstructions, like the one that I'm showing here. It's not just, first of all, it's not just one tree, it's lots of trees put together to get a single phrenology, and then lots of phrenology is put together to form predictors of particular targets. In this case, the hydroclimate target is the Palmer Drought Severity Index, which is not quite a, doesn't quite have a, uh, a, a unit distribution, it's not a perfect z-score, but it's close to a unit variability. So they get like a z-score of drought through time. And wet is going to be up and dry is going to be down. What they've done here, this is from a very important paper on mega drought in 2004 from Ed Cook at Columbia. They've taken that Palmer drought severity index and looked at the fraction of the whole West that is experiencing severe drought. And see these periods, you know, in the what's called the medieval period, the medieval warm interval of 900, you know, 80, 1080, where you have intervals where not just, you know, the, the mean is even lower, it's widespread. So you have, you know, almost the whole West experiencing drought conditions as bad or worse than anything seen during the 20th century, but for decades. And at the bottom you zoom in and you can see that there's really nothing Something comparable, the long term, the long term mean was actually probably different during these multi-decadal periods of aridity in the West. This is the worst one, to give you a sense for the spatial scale of the site. Uh, this is a it's a gridded reconstruction. So the the tree ring data have been used, a huge number, thousands of tree ring chronologies go into this. Can I just turn this off and just go? You don't think my recording is going to pick it up? Huh? I, don't want to, I don't want to disappoint the you know three or four people on YouTube in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to suffer. This is like the opposite of utilitarian. The the target is a grid of PDSI observations in the historical period. The network is a bunch of sites, and it's used to make these reconstructions. And again, I'm just showing 
an average of the total domain that's in uh, in severe gut, what we consider as a severe gut. And this negative two, you can see the four corners region, the headwaters of the Colorado River, much of the southwest, on average over a 35 year period, looks as bad as some of the multi year droughts that we've seen over the southwest. So these, are, these, these would have a, a big impact on the water resources, on soil moisture, on agriculture, if they were to occur. Again, and it's not just a North American problem, this is another reconstruction from Central America. And again, you see these multi-decadal periods that really some of which are coincided with really important uh, pre-industrial events in the people of the other people that were living during those times. And through our own work and through a number of previous studies, we've come up with a, a rate that's been estimated empirically and is consistent with some basic statistical constraints. A rate of decadal droughts, so these are things like the 1930s dust bowl, the 1950s drought in the southwest, even the recent drought in California has been called by a decadal drought. And they tend to happen one or two times per century. And our infrastructure in the West is uh, it's, it's, added, it's designed around that kind of risk. In, in, in other words, we can handle that kind of a drought without catastrophic losses. But multi decadal mega droughts have been in the pre-industrial country a very, very infrequent phenomenon. And again, this is supported by empirical observations of, of which we have a few, a handful. And also some more um, basic statistical constraints in the nature and the frequency of these events. For a 35 year old decade Omega drug, we're talking about one or two events per moment, but very, very rare, very, very rare events in pre industrial times. But we have changing climate. So, how does climate change affect the statistics of decadal drought, especially multi decadal Omega drug? What can we expect in this century? Because it's not just going to be the historical average. This is the slide I put in there for, for those of you. Who find yourself in the situation I find myself in all the time, talking about climate change with someone who is your obnoxious neighbor or the guy on the plane who has an opinion about your work. Like, don't sit down next to somebody on a plane, like, oh, you smell widgets? You suck. Job. <laughs> but that's kind of what people say when you tell them you study climate change and sitting next to you on the plane, like, oh, that's phobia. But, but that's, I mean, you don't even know that I'm. Reasonably confident, you can't make that judgment about my whole career just like that. So, when you find yourself in this situation, the one thing that people really don't get, and it's so intuitive that everyone should get about climate change, is that the way that we get rid of heat on planet Earth is different from how we absorb heat. So, it's visible light that comes in the surface, and when it leaves, it leaves the form of invisible infrared electromagnetic radiation. And when we put more carbon dioxide in, atmosphere, we slow down the cooling rate, and we experience that slow down in the cooling rate as warming. Just like you put more and more blankets on, you get warmer and warmer on a cool night. So say something like that, you know, there's been social science studies that show that uh, that actually can convince people more effectively than just yelling at them next to you on the plane and personally getting kicked off the plane. That's asking, oh, how can you believe something so crazy? There was an Australian senator that was quoted recently saying, uh, the atmosphere, I'm not going to do this right. The atmosphere, don't worry. The atmosphere removes heat from the land surface. How can the atmosphere warm the Earth's surface? It cannot. That's why all the computer models are wrong. Like, okay, replace that with blanket. A blanket removes heat from the surface of the body. How can a blanket warm a body? It cannot. That's why. That's why all the models are wrong. So far, the changes in human activity have added up to about 2.3 watts per meter squared of radiative imbalance as compared to pre industrial times. 2.3 watts per meter squared over the surface of the Earth, that's the equivalent to the radiant, watts of radiant energy from one well lit Christmas tree on every square meter of the planet. The planet stays place as it integrates in space and time in relation to the heat energy released by atomic explosions. It's about 4 per second. The heat energy released. Four atomic explosions per second. That's about the imbalance that we have imposed in the climate system through burning fossil fuels and having more carbon dioxide and more methane in the atmosphere than we need to have. And you predict from theoretical grounds, much like the scientists in the late 19th century did, that you would see warming. They thought it'd be great because the Swedish physicist in uh, the Little Ice Age, the cool period, the late 19th century, uh, uh, predicted that the Industrial Revolution would make things better because it would warm up the climate. Not hard to understand when you see the Swedish scientists in the Little Ice Age. 
this is for April. I mean, I could replace this with with last month or any month in the last 16 months because it's deep warming everywhere. But it's well on the way. We're running the experiment that matters. We'll get some good data on how the Earth actually responds to climate change. Uh, this is from the Arctic of summer, which is in Antarctica, the second warmest, second most place, but the warmest and second most place for the Arctic summer on record. Uh, this is from a former student of mine, Jack Lady. And it just shows that the Arctic temperatures are off the charts, almost off the charts, literally. Alaska's temperatures are supposed to be extremely high. And this is some of you, I'm sure, you know about this hiatus. This is about this false debate about the hiatus. But there's been a slowdown, quote unquote, in the, in the rate of warming in recent years. Um, when you examine the whole historical record, putting together multiple data products and different observations, you don't really see much evidence that the, the slight little little plateau at the top there is uh, inconsistent with the overall warming trend. And in fact, now if you add on 2016, 2015, 2016, 2014, it's, it's right back in line in the long term. So one of the things that tells us um, for climate is that climate change is more likely to look like a staircase, not a ramp. Okay, good to know. There's also implications for negative that I won't go into, but I'll get into in a second. And this is, you know, this is the NASA record, but the uh, the IPCC intergovernmental panel on climate change, when they collate information from many groups using different instruments, different uh, observational techniques, even different variables in the climate system, have painted a very consistent picture. So you can go through this and see. Temperature, uh, air, land air temperature, sea surface temperature, marine air temperature, which probably look differently, but they're all warming. Uh, sea level, and in sea level, there's actually no hiatus. There's no slowdown in the rate of sea level rise, not because of melting, but because a lot of the heat energy that harvests in balance is 2.3 watts meters per hour is going straight into the ocean, and it's causing oceans to warm, and those oceans to warm to expand, which is one of the reasons why you don't see a slowdown. Summer Arctic sea ice is just plummeting again. If we had the 2016 would be further off the charts. Tropospheric air temperatures in anywhere. That, that right panel is from what's called reanalysis. So you're using a model to simulate observational data and constrain it with some basic physics about how uh, the atmosphere and the climate system move energy and mass around. And they're all they're all consistent with each other and they're independent. Many of them are completely independent and they're from different groups and different methods. And so there's a consistency that things are, are changing and they're changing quick. And I probably don't need to convince of that, but hopefully excuse me, and emission for your uncle or your neighbor or your godmother. What's a girl? I don't know if I'm not trying to be gender specific about them. I just they're they come in all shapes and forms. Alright. The real system is more complicated than a simple radiative imbalance because we've got clouds and ozone and all kinds of interacting parts and it's a coupled climate system that we have to try to model. And we can do it in a face of problems interesting and not intractable, but interesting. And one of the other tools that I work with, uh, because I should probably be running, I'm obviously not going to have to work, is uh, computer models. And we have these computer models that are analogous to the kinds of, uh, you know, you've seen three-dimensional video games, and you watch a, you know, a, a building with smoke curling on top of the building. It's not statistics that's doing that. It's some numerical approximation of the flow of fluid in a three-dimensional grid in a video game. And when we do the fine modeling, it's the same thing. We've got a three-dimensional grid across the whole Earth, across the ocean, across the cryosphere, but we're solving for the physical equations that give you flow and exchange of energy and mass in a three-dimensional grid as it evolves through time. It's tremendously computationally expensive. It takes though for some of the experiments we do, we use 60,000 processes or more. And again, one of the key components that we Try to evaluate these models with the role of external forcing other than the ones driven by human activities. So, explosive volcanism, the Pinatubo eruption of 1992, you know, had a big tactical cooling impact over, over the globe, and it also had some potential circulation impacts as well. So, we put those events that are now just happening in the past into the model. We use changes in solar activity, which, by the way, are tiny. So, some of the model is called the sun. First of all, the sun's variability has been decreasing at steady levels in the last 30 years while the temperatures have been warming. But we also include solar variability in the model experiments and it doesn't account for the kind of warming that we've seen. Uh, 
this one was I put this in there because there was a, a senator or a, a congressperson that uh, was it was shown in the Daily Show back when it was still run by uh, John Stewart talking about the the models don't have the wobble. Once you've seen this clip, they don't have the wobble here. And he does this you know, entertaining wobble. Actually, they do. So come on. And uh, the wobble is just the change in the Earth's orbit and how incoming solar radiation gets distributed as a function of latitude. Have to change very slowly over the last few thousand years, and it's included in the models. So we do it better. And of course, it's a big term for the last hundred years, and you can see it's human activities, including land use change, greenhouse gases, other aerosols. And we run around the future, there's a bunch of unsurprising things that happen. You know, sometimes things get hotter and get more heated. It's shocker, right? Uh, it's it's even more impressive, though, when you look at a business as usual scenario. This is a paper. This is actually a quote from a peer-reviewed paper from a colleague at NCAR Building called Flavio Lerner. Um, he he looked at the business as usual scenario for record-breaking heat. So extreme heat waves that would be that would that would be headline-worthy now, and the rate of those extreme heat waves. Record-breaking extreme heat waves is like one every other year by the end of the century, the business as usual. And you can look at other heat-related variables. This is like the whole northern hemisphere, basically globally, this this whole zone. So every every summer, be warmer than the warmest summer in the solar system. And it's just an astonishing result. Now it's simple, it's incredibly simple, and it's incredibly predictable. We look at the radiated and balance of 2.3 watts per meter squared, which is expected. The more extreme rain, and we're seeing this a lot in the Northeast, up until this last drought. Uh, you get more, you get more warmth in the atmosphere. The atmosphere for holds more water vapor, but then when that water vapor congeals into clouds that fall out of rain, you get more extreme heat. So you also get more extreme rain. This is a paper that just came out from the same guy, Zach Lee, undergrad, who looked at frost risk during a changing climate. By having an index of spring and start, spring onset and start, that's just purely meteorologically based, climatologically based, and then identifying the amount of time that elapses on average between start of spring and the last freeze. And what he shows, among other things, you know, okay, 2012 is the earliest spring on record, becomes the average by about mid century, but the risk of frost to certain certain speeds at certain times is expected is predicted to decrease because you have uh, you have events that are still cold. Now, they might be 17 degrees, which is cold, which is potentially damaging, as opposed to negative 17 degrees. But either way, they're cold. Whereas the warmth is an integrated effect on the start of spring. So that integrated effect of warmer temperatures on average is pushing the spring onset dates further and further forward in time, where that last freeze date doesn't change as quickly because it's, it's a threshold. So that's more stochastic. And because it's more stochastic, it just doesn't follow the start of the season. And then, of course, the hurricane issue, not to go into too much, but the, the take home would be that two of the most robust predictions coming out of climate science recent, recent research is that we get more big storms, you know, these are the categories four and five, which are rare now, so increasing them uh, by even a little bit doesn't take much because there aren't that many of them. But still, we expect an increase in big storms as well as the sea level rise, which means that the little storms, the hurricane Sandys, the smaller, you know, cat ones and twos and threes can do much more damage in the little area. They cause flooding, cause problems with irrigation, from uh, you know, the Hudson River, where it can get backed up behind the saltwater intrusion. And you find the irrigation is very stringent, it's very stringent an issue with high sea level, and a, even a small storm coming in and pushing up a small storm surge is more effective because it's the baseline. Uh, those are very, those are the very robust things that come out of climate change simulations. And then back to mega drought. So. Here we've got the same Palmer drought severity index reconstruction, and it's been smooth uh, with, uh, with a band pass filter. So we filtered out the low frequency and called it home. This is from our paper that was published last year. And it highlights this low frequency, multi decadal nature. And you see some of these big events averaged over the South Coast. Decadal scale events in that. At a rate of maybe this is a two word, so maybe one or two per millennium. And we've tacked on to this, we've integrated this, which is an annually resolved 
Bob Drayton for years, Caitlin Smith, uh, Rector's Jeff Pat from Green Data. We've added to this all of the state of the art climate change projections going in to the future. And the story tells itself there. In general, the consensus view from the models, the preponderance of evidence from the models in the southwest, is a climate that is drier on average. And because it's drier on average, because the moisture balance shifts towards average conditions that are more arid, the risk of mega droughts just skyrockets. And it's, it's happening now, it's happening soon. Like it's, this is not in 20, 2050, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have already shifted in the by a substantial enough percent that it will cause a two or three fold increase in likelihood. And by the end of the century, the risk of a multi decade old mega drought gets up to 70. Or 80%. Here's the animation of soil moisture average across these models uh, for North America. Starts in 1950, and just remember brown is dry. Brown is dry. Or in the future, brown is dry. This is three or four standard And it's not just a North American problem, it's not just a Southwest problem. We assess the global picture. It's just as bad, if not worse, in other parts of the world. Really want to hear a few of them. In Ghana, obviously, it's the how sub Saharan Africa, uh, East Coast of Africa, much of South Africa, parts of Australia, much of Brazil, including some of the Amazon, Central America, and Southwest. These are places that we will see unprecedented levels. The atmosphere as a dumping ground for rainfall. So you have two weeks, you warm temperatures, and there's two effects. Number one, you, you make it hotter and you make it easier to pull moisture out of the soil. But that, that effect is not here, in fact. It's, that effect isn't even accounted for, it is now. So we're, we're doing another paper now we're working on to look at the relative contribution of precipitation and temperature in this picture. But this is just the precipitation only story. We get precipitation decreases globally. Semi arid in the Pacific, the Mediterranean, for example, you get weather patterns that move on average, and storm tracks go either further north or further south, and you get a change in the standing high pressure cell kind of world, and that drives moisture away from semi arid regions, and it makes the likelihood of mega drought just shoot way up. And it's, it's a precipitation story in this diagram, and temperature makes it even worse. So, this is a conservative estimate of risk in the future. Well, if we keep using the atmosphere as a dumping ground for which we do. So I want to finish here and uh, hopefully give you a sense of some of the things that we worked on. Just to recap, uh, mega droughts in the past linked the demise of pre industrial civilization. And now, well, obvious question, do we have differences in our, in our water infrastructure and can we move water around on scales that are unprecedented in pre industrial times? Of course we can. But there's there's much more resilience built into the water infrastructure of the southwest now than there would have been in the times of the medieval climate period, uh, but long ago. Uh, this rate of one two per millennium is almost certainly way too conservative. It's, it's probably a factor of 10 to 50 times higher than that now in terms of likelihood. Uh, we expect increased risk. Uh, in a study that's coming out fairly soon, we argue that mitigation cuts these risks almost in half. And then the part that's really most unconstrained and most unresolved and where the work of the people in the room and DPI in general and, and people who spend their time thinking and, and, and trying to use climate information to plan for it and have a, a more resilient system of producing food, there are things that we haven't accounted for directly. Indirectly, yes. But the role of CO2 in directly being able to improve the water use efficiency of certain things, uh, we don't factor that in. And it could mitigate, it could actually lower the risk, it could pull back. So instead of having 80%, it might go down to 20%. And that is every, every percent of the state helps. Irrigation, we don't factor in. I mean, on what scale do we need irrigation? I think that in this paper that's going to come out in a couple of weeks, it's implied by the, by, the, by the residual amount of precipitation you would need to make up for the demand coming out of, of the higher temperatures. 
future, but we haven't addressed it directly. So do we need a 30%, 20%, or 15%, or 50 or 150% increase in irrigation in certain regions to be able to keep risk levels or soil moisture levels at about the same point that they've been in the historical period? I don't know. We haven't done that. Crop type, land use, this could be extended to land use, you know, and, and different varieties of crop challenges. We're not just talking about mega drought risk for long term risk. We're also talking about much hotter temperatures. And by the way, when soils are dry, when you're in a prolonged period of aridity, especially if you start to have some vegetation turnover and you end up with a, a drier ecosystem on average, if you're putting less surface energy into latent heat, then the near surface temperatures are predicted to be much hotter. So those heat waves, those Predictions about you know that summer, every other summer being hotter than the hottest summer on record. Even that's probably conservative if you're in a region that's also experiencing a mega drought because it's dry. It's also going to be hot on top of that background storm. So that's what I got. Um, I would be happy to have a larger discussion or take questions. Uh, my own tiny source of I think, application. We haven't really done much yet. The the direction I see some of what we're doing going now is focusing on shorter, more immediate time horizons. Because we've published these papers, we've talked to stakeholders and water users and resource managers and regional planners, and they basically say, well, 2050 is just too far out to deal with. Now, for research and for planning for the, you know, the, the, the crop that we're going to have in the 21st century, sure, but we can handle it. But for a lot of the stakeholders we interact with, you know, 2050 is too far out. What they want is something analogous to, this is the app my iPhone, where you can see, you can see in, in real time in your weather radar app the storms as they come into your field, right? So you can plan to get the tractor out of the field this afternoon and, and avoid, you know, kind of avoid the, the showers or the thunderstorms. They want that, but for 10 days, 30, 90, 90 days, a month, a year, short-term, short-term predictions. And we're working on it. It's an incredibly, incredibly challenging to make short-term predictions that are accurate, accurate and reliable and communicate the sources, the multiple sources and the level of uncertainty of those predictions. Especially for the Northeast, it's better in the Southwest. If you have Nino signal that's really strong in the Southwest and gives you some more potential predictability on seasonal time horizons. In the Northeast, we don't have that. We're working on it. We, don't, we haven't identified anything that's purely at Del Nino for making accurate predictions, but that's where we're going. And it's a collaborative effort, and I think one of the things that's really rewarding and really exciting being part of Cornell and, and CALS is the interaction that we're able to have, I'm able to have with the stakeholders and with actual farmers and growers who are literally out in the field and whose lives and livelihoods are impacted by climate change. And it's, a, it's a, an important part of how I've designed some of my research now because I think when you work at a place like NCAR, it's going up with the YouTube. I don't need to knock NCAR, three people on YouTube in the future. But one of the problems I had in NCAR was it was very distant, very separate from the reality, the lives, the livelihoods of people who are being affected by climate change, which have to adapt to and cope with climate change. Because it's just the modeling and the statistical elements. It's totally divorced from the real world. And what I like about what we're doing now, I'm trying to target the seasonal time scale to be most challenging, is that it forces us to go out and go to the New York State Ag Forum and talk with farmers and growers and ask them, you know, is this useful to me? They say, yeah. How about this? They say, yeah. I mean, that's yes, yes. So the story ends with me going back in 2017 with, you know, with more information about drought and potential predictability of drought on three months to nine months time horizon. They say, is this useful? And I was expecting to say no. But that's, that's where we're going is this, uh, I think it was like a conveyor belt of research that's integrated with the end user, and the, where the end user has stakes in giving us feedback on the research itself, which then has been used to customize it to, to recalibrate where we're going with the climate science and the seasonal predictions. Happy to answer questions. That's all I got. Thank you.
this is what I'm like, normalize the So yes, north of about 40 degrees, 45 degrees, we're predicting that it's expected to be wetter on that. So this is summer as well, which is increases. And that seemingly paradoxical result, we think is resolved by higher temperatures. So that you get more rain, but drier temperatures, because the summer temperatures become higher. But this is where the land type, land, land use and vegetation type could matter profoundly. And it actually reverses the sign. Yeah. Does that mean the degree of the town water? Yeah. That would be one technique. Uh, but, I, yeah, but no, I mean, I think that vegetation type itself, they could use water differently, might also act against this picture. This is, this is assuming very little or no change in, in vegetation. And we had these models to set it, but in general, let's say, let's say we don't change vegetation, this is the picture we get. And we don't factor in necessarily, some of the models do, but not all of them factor in the direct you know, fertilization effect and water use. So for the northeast, this picture, I think it's troubling because it shows drier conditions on average, which will have elevated risks, but it requires more work to look at land cover, land use, and direct CO2 fertilization effects. And this is where the southwestern picture is very robust. It might be reduced a little. I have not honestly looked in a lot of detail at the wet, uh, the wet region here. We do see precipitation decreases on average. We're talking about standard deviations, so there's already a lot of variability, and the mean is high. And so this is already normalized so that you, you do see a substantial decrease. I'm not sure that it puts us in the region of a third of the climate zone of the desert necessarily. It could just be a lot drier. You're starting, you're starting with wet, but you get a lot drier. And it's hot, so it can a lot drier, but still be reasonably wet compared to compared to other parts. Darker in this model just means dry. Dry, it doesn't mean that it doesn't. Yeah. Here it means going from desert to more of a desert. Here it means going from more of a desert to even more of a desert, right? And then down here, I have not looked carefully enough to tell you exactly what what level of soil moisture we. But in general, you do see average drying in a lot of the Central and South American uh, you know, neotropical zones. Increased risk of drought. 